all right hi everyone and welcome back to this channel i'm dr sam and today we are going to chat about inbd practice questions regarding periodontics all right so let's get started so the first question is going to be about instrument sharpening most people i have known tend to overlook this part either because it's too confusing or they haven't really understood what exactly to do and so they just learn it by heart but hey in reality this is one of the most important parts because if you have sharper instruments your scaling will be faster and is better for the patient rather than wasting a long time hand scaling and if the instruments are kept up to date it takes like a couple strokes or a minute or two to sharpen the whole set of perio instruments so let's get to this question when sharpening the scaling instruments how to prevent the formation of wire edge on the instrument when using up or down or back and forth strokes now the options are finishing with an upstroke drawn away from the cutting edge or finishing with a downstroke drawn towards the cutting edge and the answer to that is finishing with a downstroke drawn towards the cutting edge of the instrument now this picture right here will definitely explain you much better about whatever I was saying the up and down stroke where the Arkansas stone is kind of held at an angle and then you use the other hand to hold the instrument a lot of people prefer this positioning i think i prefer this where you keep one hand stable or one surface stable in this case it's the arkansas stone which is on the tabletop and you just use your other hand to kind of move the instrument and as you can see the angle of curvature or the cutting edge is here direction of pulling is towards the cutting edge so that's what is the answer for this question so when you know this now how do we know whether our instruments are sharp or dull well there's a very easy way to understand that what we can do is use our saliva ejector and just kind of check with our instrument on it if it binds it gives out a very specific kind of a ding you know it gets stuck on that saliva ejector if it doesn't mind that means it's blunt and the other way to do it is basically this is a scalar right these are the cutting edges for the scalar for a universal curette and a gracie curette and these are your bevels if it is a blunt instrument you will see the shiny surface area because when it becomes blunt the surface area increases when it's a sharp instrument it's like a razor thin blade so you won't see any shiny surface on this part so this is a sharp one sharp instrument whereas this is a blunt instrument all right so let's go to the next question now next question your patient is a 70 year old male who has a history of heart disease and stroke he is taking aspirin daily but his physician assures you that you may treat him safely upon examination the interdental papillae are edematous and erythematous and there is heavy calculus present on the teeth using a periodontal probe you detect generalized attachment loss of five to six millimeters around 35 percent of the existing sites most of his restorations have overhanging margins there is generalized horizontal bone loss on the radiographs your diagnosis for this patient is now this seems to be a relatively easier question right since there's generalized horizontal bone loss obviously it's not going to be gingivitis it obviously is not going to be localized also localized severe chronic periodontitis no it can be generalized severe chronic periodontitis or generalized aggressive periodontitis now he's a 70 year old man so obviously not young so this goes out of the picture is it going to be generalized severe chronic periodontitis or periodontitis associated with systemic disease now the answer for this is here when you look at this 35 percent is generalized that's that comes in the definition of generalized severe chronic periodontitis almost so the answer is this but let me tell you why it's not this because he does have a history of heart disease and a stroke whereas heart disease and stroke can be very well associated 
as an outcome of periodontitis too. They are not going to give rise to periodontitis, but periodontitis, it puts him at a higher risk of a heart disease and stroke. So the answer is not systemic disease. It is generalized severe chronic periodontitis. Let's go to the next question. With your periodontal probe, you measure a eight millimeter pocket depth on one aspect of the tooth number 29. On the same surface, there is no recession. On the facial, when you check the CJ with your periodontal probe, you locate it at four millimeters below the gingival margin. So for better understanding, I just added this image here, okay? Now, this is the tooth. This is the enamel of the tooth. This is the CEJ, and this is the root surface of the tooth. This is where you measure the pocket from. This is the gingival margin. This is the base of the pocket. And the whole thing is the pocket depth. And from the CEJ to the base of the pocket is the attachment loss. So in our case, so the pocket depth is eight millimeters and the gingiva is about four millimeters. So the attachment loss, which is from here till here, will be eight minus four, which is four millimeters. Okay, so the answer will be four millimeters. Now, let's see some other scenarios. This is the same one. This is where there is no recession, but there is a pocket. This is when there is recession, gum recession, and there is a pocket. This is like our question, when there is no recession, but there is rather extra gingival tissue above the CEJ or on the tooth surface. When there is extra, you basically have to subtract the values. When there is no difference between the gingival level and the CEJ markings, then the pocket depth is equal to the clinical attachment loss. When there is recession out here, the clinical attachment loss is equal to the recession plus pocket depth. So here, the clinical attachment loss pocket depth minus the amount of extra gum tissue. All right, so let's go to the next slide now. So which of the following is an example of a mucogingival defect? Mucogingival defects are attached, are concerned with attached gingiva. And in order to explain that, I again have a diagram for you. So now this is the normal condition, okay? This is your marginal gingiva right this is your attached gingiva where there is bone present and the gums are attached to the bone on the facial part and this is your mucogingival junction and beyond the mucogingival junction is your alveolar mucosa so when there is inadequate zone of attached gingiva that means this has gone down all the way up till here or here that's when you have a mucogingival defect. When there is inadequate zone of pulvular mucosa, then in that case, the vestibule is smaller. That's not a mucogingival defect. A fenestration on the facial surface of the canine somewhere here, exposed bone, that is also not a mucogingival defect. Furcation involvement on the buccal surface of a molar, that is also not a mucogingival defect because this only says on the buccal surface, so not a mucogingival defect either. Mucogingival defects involve locations where the gum is not attached to the tooth, but rather mucosa or cheek tissues. And these locations are vulnerable to recessions as a consequence. Many times, there are muscle pulls in these areas, and these makes it you know makes this quite worse perpetuate the recession and loosen the gums even further in these regions and that's why mucogingival defects can occur in these parts okay let's see what's happening here miller's classification type 1 says that there's recession on the buccal surface of the tooth but there's enough bone support the bone level is normal and the recession has not yet reached the mucogingival junction. Class 2 is when the recession has reached beyond the mucogingival junction and that's when it's a mucogingival defect. Attached gingiva is gone, compromised. But the bone level is still normal. And then class 3 is when there is enough amount of bone loss to cause you know, recession in the interproximal areas and recession in the facial areas also but it has still not caused the mucogingival junction. And level four 
or class 4 is when it has crossed the mucogingival junction the bone loss is adequate is so much that you know there's interdental bone loss bone loss on the adjacent teeth bone loss on the facial aspect of the tooth and also the recession has reached the mucogingival junction so i just explained the rest of the uh, ideas so that it's easier to remember let's go to the next question so i gave a fairly easy question for the next one because uh, peri-implantitis microorganisms are well you just have to know this gram negative rods and spirochetes okay then question number six all right i was watching some tom hanks movie so i guess there you go mr tom hanks a 26 year old engineer presents to your office with a chief complaint of painful swelling on the lower right premolar tooth he reports no significant medical history and has smoked one pack each day for past seven years he reports the pain started two days ago and is described by the patient as being dull and constant. The swelling on the tooth number 28 has become progressively larger, swelling on the tooth and more noticeable over time. He does not have a fever. There are no palpable lymph nodes. Mr. Tom informs you that he brushes his teeth twice a day and occasionally flosses. On examination, you notice deposits of plaque at the cervical and the interproximal areas of his teeth. And there is moderate gingival inflammation. So you only are seeing deposits of plaque and there is moderate gingival inflammation around 28. Localized supra and subgingival calculus deposits are found. The clinical examination also reveals a large swelling on the buccal aspect of number 28. The peri Apical radiograph of the area reveals that the alveolar crest is about 2 millimeters. Okay, so this is a very important line. Periapical radiograph of the area reveals alveolar crest is about 2 millimeters from the CJ on the mesial and distal aspect of number 28, which is more or less around the normal levels. Pocket depths on number 28 are 5 millimeters, 6 millimeters. 5 millimeters so the buccal ones you can see the buccal pockets are more 5 6 and 5 the lingual pockets are around 4 and 3 there is bleeding and probing on all six sites bleeding and probing means there is inflammation now what is the diagnosis the diagnosis NUG no it's not going to be NUG because they have not told us about any ulcerating areas on the gums can it be a periapical abscess well the periapical radiographs don't show abscess areas right they don't show any problems they're not talking about that so not a periapical abscess can it be acute gingival periodontal or pericoronal abscess now pericoronal abscess usually occurs around the wisdom teeth area so let's cancel that when you see bigger pocket depths you might think oh it could be a periodontal abscess but hey wait a second he has moderate gingival inflammation around 28. That means this is an acute gingival abscess and not a periodontal abscess. It's an acute gingival abscess. So that's why you have to read the questions really, really well. Because if it was a periodontal abscess, all of those readings would be much, much deeper. And, you know, th there would be some other periodontal areas too periodontally involved areas also he does have subgingival localized deposits but they've not mentioned where they are most commonly in a 26 year old patient you know you can find localized subgingival deposits near your lower front teeth and the maxillary molars on the buccal aspects and the linguals of the molars on the lower teeth so okay so let's go to the next question which is Angular defects are classified as per the number of osseous walls that will be left after the surgery, the number of osseous walls that were destroyed by the periodontal disease, periodontal probe readings, or the number of osseous walls left surrounding the tooth in the mouth with the periodontal disease. Now, if you've not learned this already, please remember the answer for this is the number of osseous walls left in surrounding the tooth because of periodontal disease it is not 
what is left after surgery it is not what were destroyed by the disease and it is not classified based on the probe readings it is actually classified only from the number of osseous walls which are left surrounding the tooth after the disease periodontal disease so the next question now is which of the following is true about the host response to gingival inflammation first response is an acute vasodilation increased number of fibroblasts decreased movement of immune cells the answer for this question is the first response is an acute vasodilation that's why you always see a lot of bleeding with gingival inflammation does the number of fibroblasts increase no it does not it actually decreases is there decreased movement of immune cells no the movement of immune cells will increase because there is gum inflammation so this is also wrong so now let's go to the next question trauma from occlusion can produce radiographically detectable changes in all of the following except which one lamina dura thickening trauma can trauma from occlusion can yes it will cause lamina dura thickening density of the surrounding cancellous bone area yes when there is a lot of clenching and grinding you do see increased density of the surrounding cancellous bone area but you also have to remember that sometimes there can be angular bone loss as well and the trauma from occlusion changes in the bone are usually reversible and the body can repair certain aspects of the damage if these excessive occlusal forces are removed but obviously if they are not removed and they result in a broken tooth then it cannot repair on its own and in that case you would need treatment right other option is alveolar crest morphology changes well yes because trauma from occlusion can cause angular bone loss will the pdl space width increase yes change in the pdl space and what happens it increases in trauma from occlusion and then periodontal pockets no so periodontal pockets are caused by local irritant and inflammation which is necessary to bring about an apical movement of the epithelial attachment so pockets are not formed from trauma from occlusion okay let's go to the next question this is a true or false kind of a question now on the facial and the lingual surfaces the pdl ligament fibers beneath the pockets follow their normal horizontal oblique course between the tooth and the bone in the suprabony pocket this is true on the facial and the lingual surfaces pdl ligament fibers follow angular pattern of adjacent bone they extend from cementum beneath the base of the pocket along the alveolar bone and over the crest to join with outer periosteum in the intra bony pockets well both of these treatments are true the answer is this all right so that's it for today guys i hope you like this video and share it with your friends or rather you know discuss it with your friends while you're doing the studies for periodontics i have discussed most of the confusing topics in perio for me i feel perio was one of the easier subjects because it's like you either know the theory or you don't you understand the the topic or you don't once you understand it you can answer all the questions pretty much well so if you have any questions please let me know in the comment section below and i will be happy to share all of the answers with you have a good day and adios for now take care